Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, St. John. It is good to be with you today. I'm really thankful for the opportunity uh, to be here and to reconnect with my schoolmates, uh, Scott and his wife, Denise, on the occasion of his 30th ordination anniversary as a pastor in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. As Scott has mentioned, uh, he and I were uh, teammates on the basketball team. And I do understand that some of you have requested to hear stories about Scott Skywalker Johnson. <laughs> now, since our basketball days were so long ago, I must offer this disclaimer up front that I nor Scott can vouch for complete accuracy of any of our basketball stories. For you must remember this was 30 plus years ago. Basketball stories can be like fish stories. Over time, they have a tendency to grow larger and larger and larger. On this seventh Sunday of the Epiphany season, as we celebrate the 30th ordination of our brother and friend, Scott, I'd like to draw your attention to a portion of the second lesson for today from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. The Apostle Paul offers these words to the church and the people of God then and now. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Thus far, our text. I'm going to spend just a moment with you around the subject, building a good foundation in a shaky world. Scott, in the year of your ordination, Ronald Reagan was our president, gas was 89 cents a gallon, stamps were 24 cents, the average apartment rent was about $395 a month, the U.S. population was 244.6 million, Aretha Franklin was the first woman to be inducted into the rocket, rock and roll Hall of Fame, The Simpson and Fox TV made their debut. We experienced things like Iran Contra, uh, Jessica McClure, a little girl, fell down a well in Midland, Texas, and down the road, PTL and Jim Baker, the scandal hit the national news. And then we fast forward 30 years. And although there have been many great achievements and gains in our nation and around the world, if we take this moment to look beneath or below the surface of our day-to-day -day existence, we now have Donald Trump as our president. We still wrestle with issues of race. We are divided along political lines. There are the matters of global warming, mass shootings and acts of terrorism that happen too often in our nation and even around the world. And the Supreme Court of our nation has declared that same-sex marriage is legal. And with all that has happened inside and outside of the 30 years of your ordination, I'm reminded of the phrase from the famous opening paragraph of Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities, written for the people in the times of 1859. Dickens says, and I quote, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, 
It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way, end quote. In our text, the Apostle Paul found himself in a shaky place among a shaky people in a position where he could declare regarding the city and the church of Corinth that it was the best of time, it was the worst of times. The city of Corinth was a major cosmopolitan city, a major seaport, a trade center, and in some ways because of the good and evil, the moral and immoral things that happened in Corinth, Corinth would be our Las Vegas of today. The people coming from near and far, from Conover and Winston-Salem under the theme of the motto, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Although if you haven't heard recently, Vegas has a new motto. What happens in Vegas goes on the internet. Paul, as the founding father of the Corinthian church, he sought to help the people of God then and now to deal with and overcome the shaken cultural chaos and confusion, the decadence and division, the immorality in their spiritual immaturity. Paul said to them, and he says to us in 1 Corinthians 3 and 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. Paul begins by acknowledging that by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. Though we, like Paul in the city of Corinth, may find ourselves living in a shaken and uncertain time, place, position, or condition, we, like Paul, can also say, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. Though we live in a shaken nation, where too many are seeking to build and secure their lives, not upon the grace God has given, but upon the foundation of the material things of this world, gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, and straw, things described by Paul in verse 12 and 13 as those things that will be revealed and tested by the fire of this life. Church all around us, we see evidence of shaken foundations that have been tested and revealed, tested and revealed in North Carolina and Florida, in Washington, D.C. and New York, in Chicago and Charlotte. We see and hear about the widening gap between the rich and the poor, the wrong people with guns killing others and being killed. Too many people in jail in our nation. Something is wrong in our nation. When we have 5% of the world's population, yet we house 25% of the world's prison population. We have too many women forgotten too soon, men gone too soon, children dying too soon, and families broken too soon. We have too many sisters waiting to exhale, children with no hope, mothers and wives who can't cope, fathers on dope, dope poor education, expensive health care. Expensive child care, too many absent fathers, hurting mothers, disintegrating families, children in poverty, students who can't read, seniors, citizens who aren't safe, and too often too many of our heroes have become zeros. How many members of St. John 
have been in the past or even now? How many of you find your life or the life of your family being shaken? How many of you feel uncertain and unsure about the foundation of your future, your children or their children? Even for us, as the people of God in 2017, the words written by Charles Dickens in 1859, they still grab our hearts with the relevant words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And yet, if we pause for a moment on this special day, as we celebrate this special occasion, by virtue of just being here today as the people of God, your very presence, my presence is a witness and testimony to the grace of God and the foundation laid by God that was established and are affirmed in special moments throughout our lives. When we were baptized and received into God's family, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our baptism was and is a testimony of God's grace at work. After confirmation class, when we were confirmed as communicant members of the church, Scott, when you were a teenager, you were confirmed and given the confirmation verse of Revelations 2 and 10, be thou faithful, Unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. When you and I passed Greek class in the seminary, when we were ordained and installed as pastors in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, all a sign of God's grace at work in our lives. On this day, as you celebrate, your 30th ordination anniversary, really any special day that God gives us, be it our birthday, wedding anniversary, retirement, all of it is a sign of God's grace that is at work in your life and mine. When men and women, boys and girls, come before this altar to be installed as church workers, leaders, Sunday school teachers, ushers, volunteers to help inside the church, on the grounds in the community. When St. John goes on mission trips to other countries and communities to witness and work and serve, all that we do is a witness and testimony, not about us, but about the grace of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God that is at work in our lives. This year, as the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate celebrates its 500th anniversary of the Reforma Reformation, under the theme, it's still all about Jesus. Even our Reformation celebration is a witness of the grace of God that is still at work. But you know what? In some ways, we really should not be surprised at what God is doing. For not only in the best of times, but even in the worst of times, God has done some of his greatest work. In the worst of time, during the Reformation, when the Catholic Church fell out of alignment with the Bible, God produced a Martin Luther, a Philip Melanchthon, and other reformers. In the worst of times, during the height of the civil rights era, God raised up a Martin Luther King, a Rosa Park, and others. In the worst of times, when a congregation was needed in then Lincoln County, North Carolina, God raised up in 1798 some Pennsylvania Dutch who helped to start this congregation. In the worst of times, when this congregation experienced fire not once but twice, in its history, what did God do? God raised up his people who not only survived, but thrived in mission and ministry. Therefore, the good news then of this moment is this. God is still calling and raising up men and women, boys and girls who will, by his grace, 
build on the foundation of Jesus Christ that was established a long time ago. Paul says today in our text, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. As we celebrate today, may our confidence lie not in man or the things of this world. May our confidence lie and depend upon what God has done for us by his grace. As we look to the future, may our hearts and faith be encouraged by the words of Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You know, when Scott and I played basketball on the seminary team in Fort Wayne, when we laced up our Converse Chuck Taylors or Nikes back in the day, when we walked out on the basketball court with our swagger, like Steph Curry or Kevin Durant, we didn't know if we would win or lose, although we sometimes had an idea. <laughs> but yet I want to say to you as the people of God, sisters and brothers in Christ, we can live every day with the assurance and confidence that we will prevail, we will come out on top, we will be victorious in the end because God in Christ has already won. You know, our human history, our human journey with God that began in the Garden of Eden, in some ways it reminds me of the chess match that was played years ago between Gary Kasparov and the IBM computer at the time called Blue. As I permit, prepare to close, pr permit me to illustrate it in this manner. God and Satan have been playing chess for a long time. God made his move in creation by placing Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan counters God's move by tempting Adam and Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. God counters by promising that he would crush the head of Satan. Satan counters by having Cain kill his brother Abel. God counters by saving the world from destruction by setting aside Noah and his family to build an ark before the flood. Satan counters by getting Noah drunk as soon as he gets off the ark. God counters by calling Abraham and promising to bless him and make him a blessing to others. Satan counters by leading the descendants of Abraham away from belief in God. God counters by raising up a young man named Joseph. Satan counters by having him sold into the hands of enemies. God counters by sending a servant leader named Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Satan counters by leading the people into idolatry and worship of false god. God counters by sending other prophets to lead and deliver the people. Satan counters by leading the people to desire worldly kings like other nations. God counters by sending more prophets and the rebuilding of the temple, Satan counters by leading the people astray and destroying the temple. God looks over the chessboard and he begins to wait. 100 years pass, God looks at the board. 200 years pass, God looks at the board. At 300 years, God leans in and he ponders over the board. 400 years pass and God decides that it's now time to move his king of king. Satan counters by having the king of kings put on a cross. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. The king of kings shouted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Satan leans back. He looks at God and smiles and says, check, 
God looked at the board, just looked at the board and shook his head. All night Friday, God looked at the board. All day Saturday, God just stared at the board. All night Saturday, God just looked at the board. But early St. John, I tell you, early, early, early Sunday morning before the rooster crowed early, God leaned over the board and said to Satan, wait one minute, I have one more move. I have a resurrection move. And God called from heaven to the King of kings and Lord of lords. God called from heaven and said, Jesus, my Jesus. And Jesus got up from the grave and said, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. God looked at Satan. He smiled and said, Check, double check, and checkmate. Hallelujah, hallelujah. St. John, your future and my future is certain and sure because Jesus got up from the grave. Yes, we live in a shaken and shaky world. But as the hymn writer says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. In Jesus' name, amen.